I'm speaking to you as a member of the Madison County Cemetery Commission. We help the township trustees take care of the over 90 pioneer cemeteries that are left here in the county. I'll be speaking about the veterans buried here in Madison County from the War of 1812. On this first slide, I still want to call it a slide, you know, old school. Yeah. Uh, we have two replacement gravestones for one, Henry Moeller on the left, David Gooding on the right, and in the middle, the 1812 reenactors out of Fort Wayne. Whenever we rededicate a cemetery that we've restored and it has a veteran from the War of 1812 in it, we call these guys down. They come in authentically reproduced uniforms and their wives and children all in period dress. Oh, it's really neat. And a working cannon. And they use that thing. And let me tell you that it steals the show each time. We have around 25 veterans of the War of 1812 here. Some of these we have stories on. We know a little bit about them, where they were born, who they married, maybe some of their kids, when they came to the area. Some, we just have names and dates. And on one, we have absolutely nothing. He's recorded as a veteran of the War of 1812, dates unknown, when he was born, when he died, name unknown. All we do know is that he is buried in grave one, row two of lot 16 in the Perkinsville Cemetery. He doesn't have a grave marker even. He is one of Madison County's unknown soldiers. We know of him because he is listed in this book. The Atlas and Record of Deceased Veterans of Madison County, Indiana. This book was produced in the late 1930s by the Adjutant General and the American Legion. He is listed as grave, site, and then name unknown, dates unknown, War of 1812 soldier. This is one of our most important resources. We have several copies of it here in the History Center. This is the Cemetery Commission copy. And most of the people I'll be mentioning tonight are recorded here. And if they're not recorded here, then they're probably in Samuel Hardin's book, The Pioneer, another. Talk about stories. Oh, yes, okay. Let's start with an 1812 veteran who is the most famous locally speaking. He is unique to the other veterans because he's not buried in Madison County. But he is one of ours, we claim him. He's buried across the border in Hamilton County at the Straw Town Cemetery. He just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, trying to do the right thing by his standards. Benjamin Fisher. Some of you may already be familiar with that name. Benjamin Fisher was killed in Strawtown in 1821. Tomahawked. Multiple blows. Native Americans. Tomahawked in the head. This was during a skirmish with Native Americans that were still in the area. This bloody incident has been titled the Strawtown Massacre in our various local history books. Benjamin was the only white settler to die. There were several Native Americans who perished, according to those same histories. Benjamin and two other settlers had gone to Strawtown to meet with the one white family living there at the time, the Shin Tappers. The husband had the only grindstone in the area. And as this was March and spring work would soon begin, Ben and his companions were there to sharpen their axes, knives, and tools. While there, a group of Miami Indians attacked the Shintapper family, charged the log cabin with weapons in hand, and would have killed the family outright had not the whites put up a stiff 
resistance. Benjamin and his two compatriots helped fight off the attackers, and in the fracas, Benjamin was killed. In, the, in this picture, the borders in the back of the trees, those trees are along the hill that goes down to White River. I give you kind of a perspective. Uh, State Road, um, West 8th Street would be to your left. Okay. And I am guessing, and correct me on this if I'm wrong, Steve, that the Shin Tapper site if you will, would have been near the water and probably in this general location since Benjamin was buried nearby on a high rise of the, white, of the bank of White River. At the point of death, when Benjamin was killed, everything stopped. Energies were spent and the living gathered up the bodies. What Benjamin and his friends didn't know at the time was that the shin tappers had been abusing the natives. They would give them alcohol, and when the Indians were drunk, Mr. Shin Tapper would beat them and steal from them. Uh, he, he even tried setting one on fire, according to one history, while the guy was still alive. The Miami Indians were outraged, of course, and that's the reason for the attack. Benjamin was buried immediately, as was the necessity of the time, on a nearby high bank of White River. His was the first grave in what would become the Straw Town Cemetery. He doesn't have a marker. If he ever did, it was probably one like these in the middle, a field stone. Literally, a stone dug up from the ground, unfinished, uninscribed, straight out of the field. His two friends were required to notify the family. And Ben had a family. Wife Hannah, several very young children, including a two-year-old son, Charles, who as an adult became a leader in the Stony Creek Township communities. This was the only time in our history that a white was killed by natives. The shock of it stayed in the minds of the residents and was memorialized in their immediate history books. It was son Charles who supplied some of the information about his father's death to several later 19th century historians. He had several mementos from his father. His father's rifle, his father's powder horn, and a piece of his father's skull. Think about that. This had to have been given to him by his mother, who would have received it from the two friends who had to bury Benjamin. That's how badly he was damaged. Charles, the son, is buried next to the very large granite gray pillar on the extreme right. That is his family plot. This is at the Woodward Gwynn, which is on the north side of State Road 32, right before you get to Lapel. Benjamin and his older brother, John, both fought in the War of 1812. Both were veterans. They served in the Pennsylvania militia. They entered our area with their extended families in the fall of 1820. That's early. They are vying as the second into the county vying for that position with the Heides in Green Township and possibly the Diltzes in Union Township. They are among the earliest of all settlers to Madison County. The earliest, of course, was the Rogers family down at Fall Creek. While Benjamin is buried at Straw Town Cemetery in Hamilton County, his wife Hannah, who remarried, Benjamin's brother John and John's wife Barbary Shetterly are all buried in the Hidden Cemetery. And that is a whole different story. This particular sign is on the south side of State Road 32, right as you're approaching the intersection of Main Street and 32. Rickers is on the southeast corner, the Lapel Medical Center on the southwest corner of that intersection. This is kind of up on a hill. This sign 
does not represent where the hidden cemetery is. It represents where we know of the only body is actually buried. In the late 1800s, a woman died. She was to be buried at the hidden. <laughs> Unfortunately, she died during a rainy season and the cemetery was flooded. And according to historical articles around that time, they took the body across the road from the cemetery and buried it in the apple orchard. This sign is about 100 yards north of where that lady was buried. If you go to Rickers today, you'll see a fence line and huge big trees. And if you go in the fall, you'll see the apples on the ground. The road referenced, we think, is Main Street on the west side of Rickers. And in that area west of Main Street that intersects with 32, that's the general location for where the hidden cemetery really was. Okay, in case you're wondering, Fishersburg is named for the Fisher family. Fishersburg is the general location of their settlement, which is on or near the Hamilton County line, yeah. It was in existence for over 40 years before Lapel was founded. When the hidden was being used by these early settlers, the cemetery was away from the living. Lapel kind of grew up around it, especially in the 20th century. This is a partial list. You'll see John Fisher, that's Benjamin's brother and a, world <laughs> and a veteran of uh, the War of 1812. He is the second name. He died in 1850. <coughs> Benjamin's wife remarried Banani Friel. She was Hannah. And she is the fifth name down. She died about 1833. John's wife, Barbary, is the fourth name down. They had a son, William, who died in 1839. George Shetterly, at the very bottom, was related to Barbary, John's wife. These are the ones we know about. Who knows how many other very early, I mean first settlers to Stony Creek, are buried now at the hidden cemetery. The cemetery itself, get this, the cemetery itself, we believe now, is buried. Okay? It was in this general location. That's the Lapel Medical Center. The road you see there is Main Street that goes on, further on into Lapel, right down under the picture is State Road 32. Rickers is on the left here. And then to the left of Rickers would be the Hidden Cemetery sign and the only burial we know of. And in between, the line of old, gosh, 100-year-old apple trees in the fence line. I've been there. I've seen the apples on the ground. You know, This is where they put her, somewhere in this area. The cemetery itself, like I said, is buried, we think, at this point. In the 1930s, some entrepreneurs in Lapel thought they needed a golf course. The golf course was to the west, to the right of this road, extending further to the right in or next to the next intersection, which is the red stoplight, okay? The Lapel Medical Center had nothing to do with the destruction of the hidden or the burial of the hidden cemetery. The golf course was in use for about 20 years. And from, again, a historical article written around the time, when they were constructing the golf course, the cemetery was in that location. They laid the cemetery stones down and put sod over it. So the men were playing on top of the cemetery. In the 1950s, if it couldn't get any worse, in the 1950s, the golf course was sold to a gravel pit. 
Now, it's my contention, my theory, that 20 years later, nobody remembered that there was a cemetery uh, in the left-hand corner or under this line of trees or on the sixth hole, you know. They didn't know, they didn't think, they didn't remember, they didn't tell the gravel guys. And why do I say that? Because in the 1950s, as many houses as were along to, and businesses, along the sides of the gravel pit, if there had been bones dug up and stones dug up, somebody would have been yelling. There wasn't any of that. We think our cemetery commission this summer took our GPR, ground penetrating radar. We scanned the green grassy areas to the left uh, in back along that tree line and even up a drive and on top of that hill. We found absolutely no disturbance in the ground area. The hill in the back had us wondering for a while. That is not a natural element. That is the debris from the gravel pit. What they didn't want to sell, what they couldn't sell, what was just junk, they piled in a long line starting in those trees to the left and working your way back behind what is now the medical center. The, the hill takes a sharp left and continues along State Road 32. That is not a natural hill. That's the debris from the gravel pit. And we think our cemetery commission is under the impression at this point that the, Sidden, uh, the hidden cemetery, its original location, is somewhere under that hill. It has been buried under that debris. Moving along, another group of families we've got some stories on have the surnames of Brown, Hardy, Culp, and McAllister. These families are all interrelated by marriage, all from Western Virginia, and they came in waves to our county. The first wave was in 1828 when Martin Brown, whose stone is on the left, and his brother-in-law, Garrett McAllister, arrived. Martin was the veteran from the War of 1812. He was buried along with family members at the Hardy Culp Cemetery in Fall Creek Township on the north side of County Road 550. We have his marker and the markers of his family members but no cemetery in which to reset the stones. This cemetery isn't even buried, yeah, covered over. The Hardy Cult was destroyed in mid 20th century by a farmer. The stones were taken up, stacked next to a tree in the fence line, and there you have a picture of them as we found them around 2006 when we confiscated the stones. They were stacked next to a tree in the fence line. The graves were plowed over repeatedly. The irony of this is that the stacking, upside down, preserved the carving. And later, in the early 1960s, the farmer sold the property to a housing developer. So now the original cemetery land plot area is the backyard for a blonde brick ranch house. Okay, in 2006, we went to this house, climbed into the driveway and up it, because it's up a hill, and there's a fence line, you can see the tall trees, and we took possession of the stones that were there, about a dozen different stones. All of the destruction of the Hardy Culp Cemetery happened before the 1973 state laws protecting, well, protecting all cemeteries. Around 2006, descendants of Martin Brown from Missouri contacted our commission and gave us some information on him. Martin received land patents for his service in the War of 1812. He purchased for $300 80 acres in the southwest quarter of Fall Creek Township. November 1828. Also buried at the Hardy Culp is Martin's sister, Julia, her stone is on the left, who married in 1813 a Captain Samuel Hardy. And like Martin, 
Captain Hardy himself may well have been a veteran of the War of 1812, or at least must have seen some military service since it is doubtful that the title Captain, which is placed on his tombstone on the right, was a mere affectation. Our commission has plans, in fact, that is our, one of our major goals this year, was to get the stones from the Hardy cult, about a dozen of them, reset at the Seibert Cemetery, still in Fall Creek Township, as memorials. And we have permission not only from the uh, township trustee, but also the Seibert uh, Cemetery um, is in the middle of IMI gravel pit. Okay, okay no, 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 no. Uh, when you're going toward Pendleton on uh, Martin Luther King and you cross over 69 and right on your left is that IMI, you see, uh, look over there. There's a stand <coughs> of trees. <coughs> That's the cemetery. The gravel people have never cut into it. In fact, they are the ones who take care of it. And they are the ones who erected a beautiful vinyl, white vinyl fence around it. It's now a focal point. You can go in there and with their permission and being very careful of the big trucks, you know, you can go and you can see the Cybert Graves, one of the first families in Fall Creek Township. But no, the IMI people have been very good about that cemetery. But we are going to reset, probably within the next month, the stones from the Hardy Culp at the Cybert Cemetery. And there'll be one goal accomplished. They'll be at least in the same township and we will have a sign that says why those stones are there. Martin Brown married Susan McAllister, sister to Garrett. Garrett and Susan's father was William McAllister himself, a veteran of the War of 1812. William had a commission in the war, which is noteworthy. In Western Virginia, where this extended family came from, he had held offices in county government. And that's the kind of person they gave commissions to. You want to be a captain? You want to be a lieutenant? You already know how to lead. You already know how to make decisions. Okay? He entered our county in 1835, one of the later waves from this large family group. He bought property across the township line in Adams Township and he lived on that farm until he died in 1864. This is his gravestone on the right at the McAllister Cemetery in Adams Township. And of course, the gravestone on the right, illegible. That's the way it is. But somebody knew something. Some genealogist had some clue because these pictures are from Find a Grave and that stone is labeled as the stone for William McAllister, died 1864, and it is the third one from the left in the picture on the left. It is curved because they wanted it to look like parchment or a scroll. And that's the way that was. And that's why I love sites like uh, Find a Grave, because it can connect you with distant cousins you don't even know you have, and they may have one little piece of information, oh my goodness, opens up a whole new picture. We had no idea that was William McAllister's stone, but somebody did. Somebody knew. Let's go north now to Andersontown. One of the very first settlers to this county seat was William Allen, born in Philadelphia, 1767. After serving in the War of 1812, he moved into Ohio, traveled further west to the New Purchase, that's us, you know, the central section of Indiana, and he entered our county in 1823. So guess who he probably knew and probably worked closely with? Barry. John Barry, the founder of Anderson. The acreage, he, we'll get to him in just a minute. Uh, the acreage that uh, William Allen purchased was two miles east of Wapaminskink. That's the Indian name for Anderson Town. I love it, Wapaminskink. It takes a little bit of a little bit to get it all out. His acreage was between here and Chesterfield. So he was around the time of Anderson's uh, founder, John Barry, 
Mr. Allen owned the first whip saw. Whip saw, or what's called a pit saw. This was high technology at the time. This was, my goodness, holy mackerel, look what we can do with this. He sawed the lumber for the first make piece mill in Chesterfield. William Allen was instrumental, as you saw on the previous slide, uh, instrumental in county government. He had, uh, he was the first county commissioner. The very first elections were held in his cabin. William was a justice of the peace, a school teacher, the first county assessor. He had things going on. But to me, the most interesting position he held was as a correspondent to the War Department during the trial for the Indian Massacres. Indian Massacres, 1824, Adams Township, a bunch of white settlers, about five or six, brutally killed an innocent family of Indians for their fur pelts. It was a money deal. The perpetrators, except for one, were caught and they were put on trial. And William Allen was the man in charge of keeping the War Department informed of any action here in Madison County. I don't think we in the 21st century appreciate how volatile a situation that could have been. William was responsible for keeping the War Department informed as to any hostile retaliation by the Native Americans. He was responsible for sending for the troops in case things got nasty. And luckily he didn't have to. This man had serious connections and capabilities. He brought game to the wilderness. And I don't mean the kind with ears. He had capabilities. He knew people. William Allen is included in several histories of our county and historian Samuel Hardin describes William as tall, slim, well-informed, he died in 1829. Later in the century, his son John was responsible for having his father's remains moved from the cemetery in Anderson, which would have been the city cemetery. That would have been the cemetery for the Native Americans, 1829, the boulevard, right down by the river. The white settlers had used it as they moved in. John, the son, had his father's remains moved to the Otterbein in Chesterfield. That would be west of Chesterfield. That's John's pillar in the middle there. His wife and children are in this section, so it's assumed that William is probably in the family plot, although he does not have a marker. And as to the Otterbein, I think I've said several times in various articles that this cemetery has more pre-Civil War veterans on record than any other burial ground in the county. More civil, pre-Civil War veterans than any other burial ground in the county. With the addition of William Allen, this cemetery has five from the War of 1812. We have William Allen at the top there, died in 1829. We have, from the book, Poor Mr. Young, we don't know his first name, we don't know anything about him. But War of 1812, he is listed. We have Henry Gunder. We know that Henry had two sons and two daughters, at least. The daughters married into local families and remained. The two sons moved on to Illinois. And then we have Daniel Nolan and John Suman. Bingo. Daniel Nolan. 1812 vet, I've discussed him in and out of print a number of times. Some of you may recognize this picture on the left. This is the Nolan log cabin that was used at Mounds Park back in the 30s and 40s as a historical point of interest. Daniel started the Otterbein Cemetery as a private family burial ground when his wife, Mary, died in 1825. That's early again. They had arrived here, 1822, purchased the land where Anderson Airport is now. That was theirs. Daniel passed away in 1829. Both had heavy granite inscribed gravestones, but these were destroyed by vandals in mid-20th centuries. Uh, you can see there the 
chips, pieces broken up, we are told by a golf club, swung heavily, and you can make out the name Daniel, as in wife of Daniel Nolan, son of Daniel Nolan, in those middle two pieces. The fifth 1812 vet buried here is John Suman. He and his family most likely traveled with the Nolans since both groups were from Maryland and both arrived in 1822 and they purchased land next to each other. That's how they did things back then. You knew each other, you married, intermarried, you traveled together, you supported each other, and when you got there, you bought land next to each other so you could help. <clears throat> the Sumans purchased acreage near the Nolans to the north. Theirs contained the vacated Delaware village of Bucktown, called by the whites that way since Chief Kilbuck and his tribe had lived there. This would be roughly across from the Timberline ga uh, campground in Chesterfield. John grew corn and raised hogs. Mm -hmm. Suman sold his hogs at the closest market at that time. Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Thank you. <laughs> and he had to drive them there. And in farmer's, ter farmer's terminology of the time, that doesn't mean he loaded them into the stock trailer and got in his pickup truck. He walked them. He walked them. <laughs> Can you imagine herding a herd of hogs from here to Cincinnati. It was most of the time they had around a thousand. Oh yeah, and they took help. They started with yeah. a thousand. And they took what, and they sold what they had left. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Left. Thank you, Lou. Um, any rate, the journey took 12 days. Right. I'm surprised it took that little, a month, I would think, you know. But his agricultural practices made him wealthy enough in 1846 to purchase the first threshing machine and later the first reaping and mowing machines in the township. Again, state of the art. These kinds of things show how progressive and successful Madison County was just a few years after being formed. And for any of you horse people out there, the most interesting picture to me is the one on the top on the right. Those horses aren't pulling. Pushing. They're pushing. pushing. Right, and so you only had to have one handler. Now look at the picture right under that. That was a more complicated affair, and you had to have two handlers. One to negotiate all the stuff you were reaping, and one to lead the horses along the field, because you couldn't run the reins through the paddles. I like the guys in the bottom, those horses. The, the, the farmer is, is figuring something out or getting things um, reestablished in the white horse. He's, they've been pulling in tandem. Both horses are standing there with a hind leg cocked and going, oh, good grief, let you get it together. Let's get this over with, you know. <laughs> I heard hot. that on his cell phone. I heard probably that. probably hot and they're thirsty. <laughs> And speaking of cemetery vandalism, our cemetery commission has done two major complete restorations of cemeteries with 1812 veterans uh, in the last 20 years or so. In 2006, we finished the restoration of the Cottrell Cemetery on Reformatory Road in Green Township, just east of Ingalls. This graveyard had been abused, as you can see, uh, used as a junkyard, uh, dug into with backhoes, dirt, and bones dumped over the hill. Check out that picture in the lower right. That's your coroner inspecting the remains. Those are femur bones. Mm. He dug into them and dumped the ref, just dumped it over the hill because he, he was uh, carving out a driveway. He needed a driveway through the cemetery into his garage. Mm -hmm. Pardon me. <sighs> okay. It took us six to seven years to get the legalities worked out, the junk and vehicles moved, the remains analyzed, the area re-landscaped, resurfaced, fenced, stones reset. In 2006, when we were finished, we had rededication ceremonies. Descendants, volunteers who helped with the restoration, speakers, reenactors, you can see them there, bagpipers, firing squads, the neighbors. It was the social event of the Green Township summer season, and everybody was there. The top picture in the middle kind of shows part of the crowd that was there. Uh, on your left, on the top, that's our own Richard Krieger. He descends from those Cottrell people. Um, 
And on the right, you see how the graves were decorated by descendants and family members there. Patriarch of the Cottrell family was John Cottrell. He still had part of his original stone. You can see that in the background. Descendants, who were very instrumental in helping to restore this cemetery, decided to get him a new stone. And when you do that, the stone is free from the government. But you have to prove, his, you have to prove service and send away for it through the Veterans Administration and the stone is free. You can see the new stone on the far right, John Cottrell, Private, Ohio Militia, War of 1812. So he's got the old stone and the new stone. In the middle, that's his wife Elizabeth. Her stone is being reset, and under that, the son Abraham. This is how the family section at the Cottrell looks now. This is a memorial stone listing those people who don't have stones, never had stones, or don't have stones at this, at this point in the Cottrell family. It's over there on the left. And I want you to notice the difference between John Cottrell's headstone in the back next to the black large stone and the three other stones in the foreground here. Those three tell you those men were veterans of the Civil War because they are new, they're government stones, and any Civil War veteran will have a stone with a shield. That shield on the front marks that man as a Civil War veteran, whether it's an old stone or a new stone. No other veterans have the shield, only the Civil War veterans. So next time you're in a graveyard and you see a stone with a shield, whether you can read it or not, that man was a Civil War veteran. This is how the Weddington in Monroe Township looked in the 1990s. Um, it wasn't overt abuse. It was more apathy and neglect. It had been let go and it became the site of a cow pasture and the cows destroyed everything. On the left, that's what it looked like without the cows before we touched it. On the right top, that's how the cemetery looked with all the broken stones after we got out all of the vegetation, the trees, underbrush. On the lower left, we have all of the stones that have been broken or stripped out along a fence line. They're being ready to be reset. And on the lower right, we have a string that marks the rows and aisles. Again, this project took several years. Melody, where is Weddington located? It's off, it's on the west side of 200 West, west of Alexandria. Okay. Uh, you have to get permission to go see it. Red Gold owns the property now. So it's south of 28? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's a, you, you've got to have them open the gates. I mean, it's up on a hill in a huge, what used to be a huge cow pasture. It's now fenced, but to get to it, you've got to go through the river and over the woods and across the field and the bridge and everything. It's, it takes a bit, yeah. This is what it looks like today, part of our re restoration ceremonies. And on the lower right, those were these commission members of the time who had this cemetery restored. John Brundage on the left, our present chairperson, Ranny Simmons. That's Nancy Draper, some of you may know her. Yeah. And then on the right is um, Vietnam vet Rob Haynes. There are three veterans of the War of 1812 at the Weddington. We don't know much about Harmon Cox or Makaija Jackson, but Henry Moeller, we know that he was at the bombing of Fort McHenry near Baltimore. This was the 1812 battle that inspired Francis Scott Key to write the words for our national anthem. Henry was stationed there and the citizens from Baltimore could see what was going on across the river. Maybe one of those mornings, Henry turned to a buddy and asked, hey, can you see by the morning light if the flag is still flying? We've been there. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Neat. Yeah, it was flying. And of course, that meant the Americans were holding out and had a chance to win. 
There's our reenactors. There are our reenactors again. They do. <laughs> we leave them until the end of the ceremony <laughs> because they fire that working <laughs> cannon. The man in the curved hat on the far right is the officer, and they go through a very specific drill in getting this cannon prepared and loaded and safe to fire. He shouts the orders. They race around and do the things. More orders, racing around and do the things. More orders, and finally he says fire, and this thing goes boom! And you can hear it with smoke and fumes in three counties, you know? And then everyone goes, yay! And when we're doing that, all of the car horns in the immediate vicinity, beep, 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 beep. And then we have to take time to get them calmed down and turned off. Everyone's going like this. And they do that three times in succession. And it's, it's wonderful each time. They steal the show. I wonder if they did the reenactment last year at Old Fort Wayne. They probably did. I mean, they are. That was, that was a noisy place. Yeah, yes. It, and they also appear at the Mississippi Wall up there at the battle. I'd like to finish by telling the story of a man that really should get more credit. A pivotal figure in American history rests at the Gooding Cemetery on the south side of County Road 700 North, just south of Frankton in Pipe Creek Township. David Gooding is a veteran of the War of 1812 and buried in grave two, row one, lot one. Gooding was a captain, served as an aide de camp, an assistant, to Colonel Richard Johnson. Captain Gooding was with the Colonel in the Battle of the Thames and was responsible for killing the Shawnee leader, Tecumseh. According to historian John Forkner and others, Colonel Johnson was wounded by Tecumseh and it may have been at this juncture that Gooding killed the Shawnee chief since aide-de-camps stayed close by commanding officers whom they would be assisting. The charismatic Tecumseh and his many Native American followers were allies to the British. When Tecumseh was killed, the Native American followers collapsed. They couldn't go on without him. They began to hurriedly vacate the field of battle. And without the tribal forces, the British lost the Battle of the Thames, a turning point in the War of 1812. According to historians, Captain Gooding never bragged about killing Tecumseh. The soldiers under his command, who witnessed the event, gave him the credit, even while others of the time claimed the honor. And the others of the time were almost without exception politicians. <laughs> Nothing ever changes. Gooding turned the tide of the battle and thus the War of 1812, America's second fight for independence. Captain David Gooding, modest American hero, was born in 1777, died in 1853. He's buried right here in Madison County. Rob Haynes on the left, veteran of the Vietnam War. John Brundage on the right, veteran of the Korean War are the two commission members who saw to it that David Gooding had the appropriate gravestone at the Gooding Cemetery. They proved his military service and ordered that replacement stone. Any questions? Those are the contact ways you can get into Pioneer Cemeteries and their stories. All of these pictures are at the website. All of this information is at the website. You can just simply, there's the address or the Madison County Historical Society website has a link directly to it. Or you can just simply Google a Pioneer Cemetery or somebody you know buried here. <laughs>